promoting human dignity and social justice and creating uh, more access to higher education, especially for those who have been denied access in the past. At that time, we were an institution of less than 300 students. We now have more than 1,200 students on our books. So we've grown rapidly in a period of four and a half years, and our growth spurt has not ended. This has meant uh, 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 a lot in terms of how it is that we work and what it is that we do, but we are very serious about sticking to our values and sticking to our principle, which is about providing an inclusive form of higher education in an environment that um, is not as, if I dare say, as impersonal as a big, as a big institution. So we're in a smaller institution where we can take care of the students who are in our charge. Um, so working from that premise, and very, very importantly, as a not-for-profit higher education institution, we have demonstrate a determination. When I say we, I'm talking about the entire Cornerstone community, which includes our board, which includes a wonderful uh, team, our, our staff, our faculty members, um, our supporters, people in our networks, the partners that we've, we've forged. We have a collective um, and unified vision of creating the spaces for this kind of thing as you're going to be experiencing tonight to happen. So for us, it was not uh, uh, a matter of uh, having to, to ponder over it when the news broke that uh, Joe Samuel has reached the end of his uh, tenure at Sakwa, that he was going to retire. Um, we thought that it would be very, very appropriate for us to host an event where we honor Joe, um, especially since I need you to know that when we started our critical dialogue series, which was one of the, the means that we were using and continue to use to put Cornerstone on the map, as it were, to ask those challenging questions, to take on the kind of issues that we feel will make a difference to, um, to our lives in South Africa. Uh, the very first person who I approached to uh, do a presentation on a critical dialogue was Joe. And I'll just give you the, a quick sense of what was going on. Our graduates in our psychology department um, who had obtained a BA with a major in, in uh, psychology were not being accepted by a certain university. Okay? And um, so I raised this problem with Joe. And Joe said, now, who are your certification bodies? Who, who um, authorizes your qualification? Um, uh, your qualifications, and I was like, the Council for Higher Education, yes. They're also the certification body for that institution. The Department of Higher Education and Training, yes. They're also the certification body for that institution. And SAKWA. So we all have one SAKWA and we have one NQS that's meant to provide portab portability of quali qualification, transition, smooth transition from one institution to another. I want to use you as a test case. And he went and he, he came and he, he spoke to us and we invited people from the higher education uh, sector to come and discuss it. And um, that very next year, because that was around about, I think, September 2015, the very next year, our students were accepted at that university. Okay? And, but Viva Joe, Viva Joe! Yeah. Our students were accepted at that university. And I dare say, that one of our students who was accepted into the Honours in Psychology program ended up topping the class that following year. So, I rest my case. I rest my case. So, uh, people, I'm not going to um, take up too much time. So, what I'm going to do instead is just to give you a sense of what happens here at Cornerstone. How many of you are here for the very, very first time? Just in the case. Hmm? In this, I suppose at at Cornerstone, you've been to Cornerstone many times before. And of course, we've also got a new building, and we'll talk a bit more about it at some point, but we're also going to be moving to a, new, a newer building. But we'll, our very own campus, uh, we're moving to very soon. This building, they're knocking down, and they're converting it into a five-star hotel. Um, so that's probably what's going to be happening in the very near future. But we'll watch the space. It's not about that tonight. What, what it is about 
is bringing together people from the higher education and more broadly education sector. And I, I, I look out and I see so many familiar faces. And I think it's so heartwarming and so touching, in fact, that people have made the time to come out to join us in honoring Joe in this way. And, um, and it's not me who's going to lead the tributes. It's all part of the program that our program director will be uh, outlining to you very soon. Um, but because it's for many of you, it's probably the very, very uh, first time that you've come to Cornerstone and you might not even have heard of Cornerstone, I'm going to spare you the long talk about what Cornerstone is all about and play you a 30-second uh, clip as, a, as a, a, a commercial break so that you can just get a, you can get a sense of what it is that we do here. But we do have brochures in the foyer, and I can ask you to collect a brochure and uh, kind of familiarize yourself with what it is that happens at Cornerstone. So, Joshua, if you can just play that short clip. Learn to change the world. I chose to follow my heart. I chose to see the bigger picture. I chose to believe that my community can still prosper. I chose to enrich my world and yours. I decided to dedicate my life to a higher purpose. I choose to listen and make a difference. I chose to change the world. Change Register now at Cornerstone Institute and learn to change the okay. world. Okay, so one of the proudest moments I have is to introduce our program director. Um, it's a very special woman. Uh, I worked um, for three years uh, with her as my boss. And what a boss, what an amazing boss. Um, I think a lot of what I am and what I do today is about emulating what Gugu uh, taught me during that period when I worked with her at the National Department of Education. But currently, as you may know, Gugu is uh, the executive director at the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls. She'd made an extensive and seminal contribution to literacy and education in South Africa. After five years as the chief executive officer of Save the Children, she joined the academy uh, the, in February of 2019. So she's been there for just over a year now, and already she's made a mark. Prior to working with Save the Children, she spent 18 years at the Department of Education and was a deeply committed contributor to a whole range of um, programs that was run um, from the Department of Education in the various uh, capacities that she served the department in, leading to the point where she became a Deputy Director General and she served under four ministers of education. Okay? Her areas of impact um, includes uh, adult basic education, adult education more broadly, the consolidation of the further education and training um, uh, colleges, and particularly playing a major role in the support services um, that, uh, that all helps to make education work. So her work caught the attention of international bodies, and in 2018, she was nominated by Save the Children International and other child rights organizations to represent civil society organization on the executive committee of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. In 2016, she was appointed vice chair of the UNESCO-led Global Alliance for Literacy. And in 2017, she was named the literacy ambassador by the Minister of Basic Education for her ongoing contribution and commitment to improving literacy in South Africa. I think we are really, really honored to have Gugu in our midst and to serve this evening um, as our program director. Uh, but he is, uh, 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 it was a tight squeeze for her because she had another commitment um, and she has to leave at 7.30. So she's going to be running a tight ship. But as soon as she's she has to hand over the baton, she will hand over to Shakira Dramat, who is, in fact, the host of our program tonight. And we'll talk a little bit more about Shakira when she comes up later. So, Gugu? The mic is yours, the floor is yours, people. A warm round of applause for Gugu. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to find a space. Uh, can I ask our guest of honor to come and join me on stage? 
and my other guest of honor, Shelley, please, please come. You've got an important role to play here, so, 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 so. I'm saving time. Uh, you know that tight ship that Noel was talking about? It's starting now. Uh, and I warned Noel, oh, good evening. <laughs> I warned, no, uh, I warned uh, Joe that uh, I'm, I'm giving him, um, I know it's about him, but I know Joe. Um, so I said to him, if he starts going longer than the time I've allocated, I'll start singing. And no one wants to hear me singing. So he's going to stick to, to the thing. It's so great to see you and, and to see so many familiar faces. It's like, uh, I, I asked Noel not to read my uh, bio because I look 16. So this 16 years of being in education just doesn't gel well with me. And I liked that they photoshopped, that's me there, it's me. They photoshopped the photo, this is a real me. But it's great to see so many people here to honor this giant, that is Jo. Um, I, I was raised by a phenomenal woman, my mother. And one of the things that my mother used to say, there are two things that she said. The first one was, when she passes, she doesn't want any speeches at a funeral. Because if you wanted to say anything, you would have said it to her when she was alive. There's no point in saying to her when she can't even hear it. So, you know, so we never, we, at, at home, we never have speeches. So she says, if you want to say something, you can organize it in your own time and tell people what you thought I should have heard because now it's about you. It's not about me. So it's good, Noel, that you organize today because Joe has, I'm not saying you're going to die soon, Joe. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that you, you get to hear what people feel and think about you. The second thing that she said to me was she never wants an obituary. You know how we write these long obituaries at the back of the program? Because she says the greatest obituary is written in, in each of the people's hearts that you've touched and that you can never write in any one document. And I'm saying again, I don't mean you're going to die soon, Joe. <laughs> This, <laughs> these are the people that have your obituary. And um, <laughs> that can tell a better story about you than your qualifications, etc., etc. There's a quote that I'd like to open with. It's from Maya Angelou. She says, courage is the most important virtue because without courage, you, can ne you cannot practice any other virg virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically but nothing consistently without courage. And I think for me, this is what describes Joe best, is that he had courage. And in between his speech, I'll tell you what that courage translates. I don't think he wants to hear what I'm gonna say about him. Uh, so I'm gonna allow him to speak so that I can calm him down. And then I'll share my escapades <laughs> with, uh, with, with, with Joe. Um, we have a, an exciting program. I decided to keep it a secret because we've got interesting surprises. I don't want to share with him. You just know Shell is here, yeah. <laughs> but you don't know the rest of what we have in store for you. Uh, in a fitting way, we've asked Joe to share with us. A friend of mine said to me, why are you so excited about uh, being a program director? I'm like, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because you know, I get to honor the, one of the most brilliant people that I've ever met. Oh, you know what, maybe I just have the opportunity to, to honor someone who, in my view, opened access to so many people. Because I met Joe when we were in adult education, he and she, him and Shelley, actually. And he was relentless in how he was going to use the qualifications framework as an access tool. I remember there was a man called Roy Williams, he used to call it um, the jungle gym. Because uh, when we started the conversation, he said, you can imagine the NQF people going into it and trying to figure out, because we had entrances, you could exit this way. And he said, Google is going to be a jungle gym. And you know what Joe did? Joe made it possible for the most, and, and uh, your school, uh, uh, Noel, is an example of that, that his focus on the most vulnerable and the excluded was probably what drove him to, to, to be the champion that he was. I've been asked to, to read his bio. Um, his bio, you know, he joined SACWA in 1997 as the director for framework implica whatever, implementation, <laughs> deputy executive officer, CEO. But I'm still saying the bio is here, though. 
I think the best bio for Joe is here. It's 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 much more alive. It's 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 what it is. So I'm going to ask him to come and share his thoughts, Joe. Watch me before I sing. I'm going to stop you. But we look forward to hearing Joe talk about um, the National Qualifications Framework Board is in a period of climate, policy, technological tsunamis, opportunities and challenges, including Corona, which has hit our shores. <laughs> Over to you, Joe. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Program Director, and um, I want to say thank you uh, to all of you who came out uh, tonight. Uh, given the fact that I've been given very strict instructions in terms of time, I think it's about 25 minutes, is it? No, it's 20 now. 20 now, okay. <laughs> I'll try my best. Also, um, the other thing that I did, I put, um, I think it's like 46 slides together. Um, and Marie Louise, who uh, is always uh, the person that gives me quite a lot of good advice, said to me, that is just too much. So I promise I will not you know, speak to every of the slides that I put together. Um, and I will try to, to summarize. Now, when Noel phoned me um, up and he said, look, they've got this critical um, dialogue series, um, and you know, we started to talk about what it is that I would talk about. Um, what um, I then informed Noel, in fact, that I was on, uh, that I was now on uh, uh, early retirement. I didn't tell Noel why I was on early retirement, and maybe I should just quickly say to you why I was. Um, there was an incident that happened last year in Parliament that I believe um, was. Um, um, an incident where the portfolio committee um, attacked Sakwa and attacked me personally. Um, and I was very upset about that. Um, then, in fact, um, I got so upset about it uh, that I decided that I'm going to resign. Um, also, the, um, I mean, one of the things that drove me to resign and to go in early retirement was that I believe that the board and the chairperson didn't protect the organization and protect the CEO. So I'm just saying it so that you know, um, I was meant to retire in two years' time, but um, you know, I'm on early retirement. So <clears throat> the key issue, um, if one talks about um, the NQF, and very often people have said to me that the NQF is really just the tool uh, of um, the neoliberals, as it were. It's a neoliberal tool and so on. OK, I'm going to fix something. Um, and my view, in fact, is that uh, the NQF uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a site of struggle. Because if one actually gives things away um, and you allow other people to come in and to dictate and so on, then in actual fact, it can be turned into um, what it is that you want to turn it into. And so I've always seen it in that way. And similarly tonight, when I speak about, um, when I speak about the NQF, speak about NQF bodies, please remember, you know, when you leave here, the one message that you must always take out with you is that the NQF is a site of struggle, as many other areas in the education and training uh, uh, arena, as it were. And so, the quote for me is uh, from Nelson Mandela where he says, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. And so for me, I think that that really kind of um, puts together what I think I'm saying. I'm saying to you, I'm saying to me, and I'm saying to everyone, you know, moving forward that we actually need to continue because if we don't, and if we don't use these um, sites of struggle, in fact, we're gonna give it over to someone else. Um, so one of the key questions always is an inquiry for what? Now Shirley is, um, is here tonight. And I'm very happy that Shirley is here because Shirley has always been the person that challenges me and all of us you know, to ask the most fundamental questions. So an inquiry for what? 
in fact, we had a, a learning uh, outcomes dialogue last year with the European Union and surely upset that whole place because she came in and she was saying, you know, you're sitting here, um, there's all of these kinds of things happening, you know, Cape Town, we can't even shower for, for three minutes, uh, there's a drought. And she really brought this whole thing about climate change very forcefully to um, the people that was there. Um, and so the key question that we started to pose again was an inquiry for what? So there are three things that I thought, you know, I will speak about tonight, where we be begin to ask that question again and again, the inquiry for what? So the first issue, um, and why I call this a tsunami, because, you know, tsunamis really shows that there's big things happening, and very often, you know, these things uh, take us by surprise. And if we are not careful and so on, then we're going to lose our lives and so on. So it is a big thing. Um, and we, of course, know that uh, a lot of people said that Jacob Zuma was a, a tsunami, you know. And in fact, we can see 10 years later, you know, really, you know, what it is that he has done, um, as it were. So I want to speak about uh, the issue of climate change. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about um, some of the policy stuff that has been happening within the continent, but also globally. And then lastly, I want to speak about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I just see Google looks at me. <laughs> so in essence, then, it's about saying, if we're talking about the national qualifications framework, what does it mean for us within the context um, you know, of the things that I'd spoken about? So one of the first things um, when one talks about an inquiry for what, um, I, I kind of remember that uh, right at the beginning we had um, what is called critical crossroad outcomes. And what we were saying in broad terms is what are the kinds of learners that we would like to see at the end of learning? And you would see there, you know, um, we would like to have learners that are critical and creative thinkers and problem solvers and all of those kind of wonderful things. And in actual fact, uh, at this uh, learning outcome seminar that we had, it was quite clear that although we are saying this is what we want, the alignment between what it is that we wanted and what we are, are putting in place, the way that we teach, what we teach, all of those kinds of stuff, it has not been aligned and the assessment has not been aligned. And so that has been one of the fundamental problems. But the point is that these critical cross outcomes was there in 1995. It was there, and so somehow we have lost it. And you would see, for example, if we talk about um, the questions about uh, climate change, you know, you can see there, it says use science and technology effectively and critically, showing responsibility towards the environment and the health of others. So it is there. It's not that it's new. Um, I will speak a little bit about that later on, but very often people are telling me about uh, you know, we it's into coding and all of those kinds of stuff. But if again, if you look at the critical crossfit outcomes, it deals with those kinds of issues about problem solving and so on and so on. But you cannot just have people code if they don't understand how to solve problems, how to think critically and so on. So, so it's not that we didn't don't have it. We do have the tools. What what we what has happened is that we are not having to use the tools effectively. You know, over the last twenty years or so. Okay, so what's the NQF? And I've used this sh uh, slide that Shirley had produced at this particular thing. Uh, you know, all of uh, I think all of you know, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But, uh, but the key thing about climate change, I mean, you know, there are some people that don't believe in global warming. Um, and we know that the U.S., for example, pulled out of the Paris Accord and so on and so forth. In South Africa, I think um, we are luckier in the sense that, um, you know, our government has taken on board the issue about the Paris Accord and climate change and so on. But then uh, the question also, it's not only about, about climate change, but it's also about what are the kind of society that we want? And is what we are doing at the moment uh, where we want wanting to be? And so I think the challenge then is, um, if one looks at the economic system and so on, you know, does that serve where we're wanting to be? 
I personally think that, uh, and so you could see the challenge in that slide is saying, so what does SAQWA and all the members of the NQF responses be? What kind of learning outcomes are needed regionally and globally and so on? That we need to rethink those fundamental things. Um, so one of the things that I started doing was to look at, okay, what is South Africa is doing in fact? And in fact, there's quite a lot of stuff that has been done. The key question is, are we on the right track? But in essence, there is a draft, a, a draft national climate change adaptation strategy uh, that government has put out. And in actual fact, what really surprised me, in fact, is that at the municipal level, there are response uh, strategies that has been put in place. However, the point for me is that I don't think that there's been enough, enough engagement, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, with people uh, and that we've interacted with this because very often one sees the issues of climate change as if it's, you know, uh, some grouping, you know, they must just do it there. Um, so, so, so look, there's quite a lot of work that has been done. In fact, in the document also, it also projects what are some of the key things that we will be faced with over the next while. Um, and as I said, you know, there is a response. However, in the document it talks about there are two kinds of things that one can do. You can look at the mitigation strategy or adaptation strategy and so on. Now, I did say that in, I'm going to speak a little bit about opportunities also, and uh, the kind of stuff that Noel had spoken about. So in the document itself, it speaks about capacity building and awareness, and I think in that area, it's an area that we're actually not doing very well. But this is what this in the document, it says that um, uh, what government needs to do, not only government, but all of us, in fact, is to develop and implement an effective communication and outreach program develop and implement training programs for government officials so that you know, people understand what. And now establish formally accredited training courses for government officials. So I mean, you know, there are quite a lot of opportunities, in fact, if one talks about this stuff. Incorporate uh, climate change adaptation into relevant uh, secondary and tertiary curricula. I'm not um, problematizing whether that's the right stuff to do, but I'm saying, you know, there are all of these kind of opportunities there and one can see that there is a progressive kind of thing that you build into, into what it is that one does. Also, I had a look at um, uh, the people writing geography and uh, agricultural science learners, and in actual fact, the number of learners that are writing uh, these at the end of grade 12, it has been increased, decreasing over the last number of years. So in other words, we are in the midst of a crisis, and in fact, less and less people are getting interested in studying this stuff and so on. Let me quickly go, um, uh, Google, to the second tsunami that I'm talking about, and that is at the Africa level, there's been quite a number of uh, uh, initiatives that has been taken. For example, I'm sure you all know that there's this big thing called uh, uh, Agenda 2063, where at an African level, a continental level, uh, there's been this thing about what is the kind of Africa that we want that deals with the kind of fundamental things, you know, move away from inequality, unemployment, all of that. We want to have this fantastic thing and so on. I'm not sure how many South Africans are really understanding, you know, what that vision is that has been there. Um, also as part of that is to create one big African market. In fact, it's the largest, this idea of an African free trade area and so on. Now again, the thing for me is I'm not saying it's right or whatever, but I do think that we must engage with it and so on. Um, these are the numbers, and I'm not going to go through that. Uh, also, for people looking at the slide, they will see the various initiatives that have been taken. But the one point I want to make in terms of this is that um, one of the sub-projects, in fact, of creating this African uh, uh, continental free, trade-free zone is the establishment of an African continental qualifications framework. Uh, there's a project, and there's a three-year process that has been developed, in fact, to get this thing going. Again, I'm gonna say, it's quite important for all of us to engage in that. Otherwise, um, we will have uh, an instrument that will not be able to be working for people with a progressive agenda. Uh, uh, there's a meeting that will be happening um, from the 1st to the 3rd of April in Pretoria, and there's a number of actors that has been invited. In fact, um, I would like to suggest that people here should also uh, there. I'm going to move fairly quickly um, because uh, 
The other thing I think that's quite important is that there's a set of qualifications framework that has been developed and so on. South Africa is one of the countries, together with the Seychelles, that already aligned its NPF uh, to, to the set of qualifications framework. Now, this is the missing ingredient that, although it's been aligned, we need to get on the certificates of people, you know, how that alignment is working, because that will then assist in terms of mobility and so on. Um, so, so also sometimes what happens, we do things, but we don't follow through, you know, so that it actually works uh, at, in the end for us. Um, then UNESCO has got a number of policy initiatives, and this is the stuff at the global level. One of the things that happened in December was there was a global convention on the recognition of higher education qualifications that was adopted by UNESCO, 193 countries. Um, and so the next stages in this is that each of the countries need to take it through their ratification processes and so on. But in essence, um, what this is about is that for the last 50, 60 years, the United uh, UNESCO tried to bring um, the globe together to say, let us agree on a set of principles and agree so that people can, their qualifications can be recognized, not only you know, in terms of the university that you spoke about, but in fact across, you know, across the world as it were. I think it's an exciting uh, thing and so on, and there's lots of good things in, in there. Um, in addition to that, there's also the Addis Convention that has been um, adopted uh, in 2014. It took something like five years, but it's on the 15th of December last year, it has actually come into effect. Um, I see that we have got uh, uh, Connie uh, September here, and uh, you know she was the chairperson uh, of the of the portfolio committee that got the Addis Convention ratified and took it, taken through our parliament. So it's a legally binding thing. But the key question again is in terms of implementation. So it is active now. There's, all of us are, are bound by that uh, statute and so on. So the other countries in this region is Seychelles uh, and Mauritius. So tomorrow if someone comes here, the question is are we ready in fact to be able to implement? That's the kind of question. Um, the third thing I think that's quite important to just quickly speak about is that we've also been part of what is called the world reference levels, and there's a tool that has been developed. Now, that tool takes one, if one thinks a little bit about it, is that not only are people looking at qualifications now, but you would see there that you can develop um, profiles, and so that the new way is to not only look at the qualification, but to look at the profiles or the competency profiles and that that is then used as a kind of common way in which qualifications and what people have achieved, you know, get measured. So it can be whether it is uh, non-formal, short course, all of those kinds of stuff. Uh, this is the common language going forward. Um, now the fourth one, uh, the, 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 the third thing that I want to speak about is the fourth industrial revolution. Now, I know that there's quite a lot of debates and so on around this. And the one point that I often make is that these things are not value free. And if we are not there, <laughs> we're going to get what other people have thought out for us and what they come to sell us. And if one looks at these algorithms that has been written, it is sexist, it is racist, and all of the kind of stuff that goes in. But if we are not in there, we will not be able to change it. And we will buy these things, and we will then ask the question, so why doesn't it work for us? It doesn't, it's not working for us because we haven't designed it, and we haven't been part and parcel of this, the design of it. So, so I'm saying that you can use these things, again, for your benefit, or, in fact, you know, for your downfall. And again, I'm saying that we need to make sure that we struggle. And it's an area of, uh, you know, it's a site of struggle. The other point that I want to make is that what the fourth industrial revolution and the kinds of stuff that people are talking about and the technologies that has been developed has also come into then ask the question, so what is the role uh, and what's the scenarios for qualifications uh, frameworks going forward? And in actual fact, um, what you see is there are two broad things that, is, that has been proposed here. 
firstly, it says that what these disruptive technologies are going to do, they're going to come and, in fact, they will sweep aside um, uh, whether there's a national qualifications framework or not. So that's the one route. The other one is saying that NPFs may be able to have a look at this stuff, look at it critically, make adaptations, and so on. Because the big thing that we are dealing with, it is not necessarily formal qualifications, but people, as you know, there's lots of experiences. There's lots of things that you've learned outside of this formal system. So if you apply for a job now, I mean, I'm 62 years young. If I apply for a job now, what is it that they're going to look at? Um, UCT is going to look at whether I've got a master's degree or whatever qualification it is. But all of the stuff that I've, you know, the experience and all of those things that I've, and the competences and so on, those things are gone. The newer technologies allow one to be able to deal with that stuff. Okay, let me quickly go. So in other words, um, if one looks at NQFs, you have things at the national level, you then have at the regional level, and at a, uh, at a continental level. And so the kind of debates then is that at the moment we've got qualifications, what is called 2.0, but the future is going to be about uh, qualifications 3.0 or 4.0. What will it look like? That debate is happening as we are sitting here. And again, I'm going to say we need to be part of that uh, discussion. I don't have the time to go into the detail, and so I'm just going to, to move forward. But the point I want to make here is the following. We can use the fourth industrial revolution tools to help us to move forward. And let me give you an example. At the moment, if you're talking about the accreditation of learning programs, in some cases, people wait up to two years for that, and longer or shorter and so on. Now, how do you keep up? How are you competitive if you must wait for so long to get stuff done? I mean, Noel has phoned me several times with tears in his eyes to say, please, Joe, you know, there's a blockage there, there's a thing there, and so on and so forth. So, so the point is that you can, you know, you can actually do something about it in terms of these tools. And so let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, we had a target at SACWA to say that um, we will register your qualification within five months. We are cash strapped. We don't have a lot of money and so on. So then the Department of Higher Education gave us uh, uh, some money. We were able to hire more staff members. So we then reduced the turnaround time to something like three months. At the same time, and given the crisis that we had last year because we had to register all the qualifications for our education by the 31st of December, we also started looking at robotics, for example. Now, what an evaluator does in a week, the robot is able to do in 45 seconds. We developed the concept. We developed uh, the proof of, of, of concept. So if you are um, a cash-strapped body, you don't have money to hire more people. But there are tools and technologies that you can use to get all the boring work out of. By all means, you know, we must use it. Um, so that it is, on the one, it's not replacing people. So it's not about the debate about replacing humans. But it's saying, what is it that humans can do? And what is it that these robotic stuff can do that can assist us? and so on. So I'm saying we need to think very carefully about how can we use these technologies to move us forward rather than simply to say, no, we don't want anything to do with it and so on. Because you can put your, your head in the sand. It's not going to work. So, so, so um, if we then talk about uh, themes uh, and opportunities, the, the stuff is all there. We have, I mean, our NPF has actually put us ahead of the game. So quality assurance, accreditation, NKFs, quality qualifications, credit accumulation and transfer and so on. All of those things are there. The, the term that has been used at the global level is now certified recognition of prior learning. We have been there and we have thought about things and so on. We actually need to see whether we can't take the leadership in terms of that. So um, 
I'd spoken about the question of um, high quality delivery, turnaround times, and so on. I think it's a serious indictment, and I do think that what we need to do as uh, what regulatory bodies and anchor bodies should do is to try to see whether we can't turn around things within a week rather than within a year. And it is possible. I know it's possible. I've seen it, uh, as it were. Um, also, what, uh, also from an opportunity perspective, um, this year the president is the chairperson of the AU. We are chair of the review, peer review mechanism. We are also the chair of the Climate Change Committee. So we can, if we take the lead and leadership, we can actually move things forward uh, in a progressive way. Again, Noel, you spoke about um, you know, that, uh, the e-learning e stuff and so on. In Saturday, there's 16 countries, 155 countries on the, on the continent, and 193 countries uh, worldwide. We need to think beyond South Africa. We need to think you know, global. Um, there's also suggestions, in fact, in terms of how a representation can work. I'm not going to go into the detail around that, but uh, we can talk about it afterwards, uh, as it were. Then Google, uh, with that look, I think it's time for me to say it's the end. My first, um, and what I did was I looked at Nelson Mandela when he was, when he was released from prison, and he, was, and he went uh, to, to, to London and to Wembley uh, to say thank you uh, for people that they rem rem remembered him and so on. You know, he had the first conference, uh, uh, concert, so this was the second concert. I thought the words were fantastic. So what I want to do is to say, my first simple and happy task is to say thank you to Noel and to Cornerstone mm -hmm. for making all of this possible, mm -hmm. uh, to Gugu and to Shirley for making it all happen. Thank you very much. I want to say thank you to Marty Louise and uh, my children, I think uh, Janine is here tonight, and my family, uh, uh, Celeste, uh, Gio, the Perez family, uh, that you choose to care and to share my time with my work because you could have decided otherwise. Thank you very much to all of you for coming out tonight and making this event special. Thank you all of you that you elected not to forget the tiny contribution that I've made to the education and training community. Thank you very much. Very proud of you, Joe. <laughs> very proud, very proud. I didn't have to look at you. <laughs> you just had my imaginary eyes looking mm. at you. But uh, th the idea was that we also allow for, for conversation, uh, for people to engage with your incredible mind. Um, and uh, I'm sure they, they've got questions that they'd like to ask, but I think it's proper for me to just ask uh, Joe's family to just stand up so we can see them. <laughs> stood up, stood up, so people can see you. There. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for being the anchor. I know uh, you brought some sanity. I'm not sure about Marie Louise, but the rest of you brought some sad sanity <laughs> into him. One of the things about Joe is that he's consistent. I remember when we started, and Shelly will remember this, and, and all of those people, uh, Wolfgang, that were in adult education at the time, that he always used to say the NQF is a site of struggle. Uh, he was consistent in that, and I think he always used to focus, as Bula, you know, in, you know on what the, the social values of what it is that we're doing and how we engage and make it our own. And the fact that he's influencing even the region, um, and it's something that's not spoken about in our way of thinking, even in, US, in UNESCO, is testimony to the fact that he, he is that kind of person. And so I'm the, I'm the person that used to use faxes. I haven't moved to the 4IR of, <laughs> of, of those things. So I want to fax something to the portfolio committee of that time and those, portf and those politicians no committee or politician can erase 22 years of excellence. No one can take away that legacy. You can remove them from an institution, but you're not going to remove it from the rest of the world. Because what you might have done unwittingly is to unleash him to greater things. Because I don't think we've seen the last of Joe. So it is, <laughs> it is what it is. So we thank them, actually, because I'm sure you were confined there. But trust Joe also to talk about something
and I panic and don't panic. You spoke about the 4IR, and I thought, oh, critical cross risk outcomes. I remember we spoke about that. And then you spoke about robots. I'm like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> because as a, as a principal, you know, you, you, you know, don't worry that they call me an executive, I'm a principal. As a principal, you struggle with what all of these things mean for children and for learning. Because everyone comes with a great idea, and they want to throw it at you, and they, you have to make it work. So every time someone for, says 4IR, I'm like, hey, when you've decided and you've made, you know, made sense of it, I'll get on that boat. For now, I'm educating my girls, <laughs> and we've got a project to go on with. Um, but I made a quote about, as I, I'm sure you're thinking about the questions, ne? Um, as I spoke, you know, I made a quote about courage and, 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 and it being the important uh, virtue. One of the virtues, Zagashu, is that he's got integrity and loyalty. And I'm going to make an example. Um, I remember one time, I was still in the department, I was a DDG, and when you're in those positions, um, everyone comes at you. Because once you shake the system, people find things. So he said to me, Guga, I want to see for breakfast. Now, I've had a crush on Joe for a very long time. Mary <laughs> knows. It's a pity God married to you, I was married to Mary, but you know. So I call him my second husband. In fact, Mary said to me, which side are you sitting next to Joe? I said, no, 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 Mary, I'll have this, and I'm going to cover it, it, it is safe. <laughs> so, so he says to me, I want to meet you for breakfast. And I'm like, a at um, Cafe 41. And I go there, and he says to me, Gugu, you've made many people angry. And I'm thinking, oh, who? Why? He says, because we've received an inquiry about your qualifications. <laughs> so someone was questioning my qualifications. And he said to me, we gave the, and this was a reporter that was checking. And, and he said, no, you, don't worry, you know, you're safe, but I'm just saying, watch your back, because someone is really, really angry. And for that kind of loyalty and integrity, you have to be courageous, because he didn't have to warn me. Uh, all he had to do was to do his job. But because he's always been a loyal friend, and also has integrity, because in his mind, he's like, why are you doing this to someone? And I'll, I'll forever be grateful, because I go to the office and there was a media inquiry. <laughs> on that matter. <laughs> but at least I was calm. I had had coffee with my Joe, <laughs> so I was good. I'm going to open for, for, <laughs> for questions. Uh, we'll do a number of rounds. Um, any questions that you'd like to ask uh, Joe? And I think there will be roving mics. So I'll take three at a time. And there's about 50 of us, so I'm sure we'll have like many rounds of questions. Looking at all of these educated people. Mario, you're not allowed to ask. I'll use my voice. Uh, any? Ye yes, ma'am. Uh, another show of hand. Thank you, Joe. You really gave me quite a lot of food for thought and. I have quite a lot of concern. I think it maybe just one or two. Firstly, you were very um, positive about the fact that our government has ratified these international conventions. <coughs> but we have ratified so many international conventions, and we know I'm not even going to rattle them off. But if you must just ask some people here in this room, and I think this is quite a learned audience, People don't know about it. So after the signing, so what mechanism do you think that we as civil society, and I think sort of uh, semi-retirees, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think could be our role? Because, I mean, it's really of concern, you know. I mean, all, I mean the, the words are wonderful. The signatures are wonderful. The, the gala dinners and having these ratifications, they are wonderful. And then just a little point at the bottom here. You know, I'm just concerned about unemployment. And, you know, I, I do understand that the ro robots can do all sorts of wonderful things. But how do we balance the needs of this developing country, you know, with massive unemployment, with major concerns around skills, and the fourth industrial revolution? Thank you. By the way, for those who do not know me, I'm Gertrude. And um, I've sort of been in education and in gender politics <laughs> with Shirley and Joe. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Hi, Joe. My name is Andre Young, and I work for a company called Business Transformation Design. Joe, my question is as follows. If we're looking at three variables, hindsight, insight, and foresight, and we look at the state of business and government today, the people we qualified, where they are not trying to protect the planet, enhance the life of a customer or a citizen, what do you think on those three variables, hindsight, insight, and foresight, is where we got it wrong? Because we sent these people into industry and into the world with these qualifications, and forgive my French, but they have let us down. And I won't use the F word. <laughs> so <laughs> what is missing? And also to Shirley, the activist, because I, what is the foresight and insight that we need to add to this qualification framework to allow the execution of a better world, a better planet, a better citizen, a better customer, a better. <laughs> do, do, do. Thank you, Andrew. The third, uh, third question. In fact, I, th I think let's allow you to, to answer those two, and then we'll take a second round. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you very much uh, for those questions. Look, I think you know the questions are kind of a, a, a broader questions for all of us to to kind of grapple with and so on. Um, let me just say, in terms of the the, the ratification of of, of conventions, um, um, I mean these things have got real. Um, what's the word? It's got teeth, as it were. Uh, because if something is ratified, it goes through Parliament. Mm. There are discussions and all of those kinds of stuff. And uh, Gertrude, you're right um, uh, that there is not just there isn't enough uh, awareness about the stuff, the implications of it, and also how one can actually uh, benefit from it, or you know, or as it were. But um, a lot of it also has got to do with um, the fact that I think it's quite important to make sure that. Um, when, the, when these conventions are being formulated and discussed and so on, you know that uh, we really need to be very clear in terms of w what are we letting ourselves in for, uh, as it were. So, um, so I would say that um, it is quite important that we, you know, that uh, when ministers or uh, sign things and so on, when it goes through Parliament, that all of those things must be taken into account. Um, uh, and um, on the other hand, I also think that those kind of experts, as it were, uh, must make sure that, uh, you know, that they're connected so that, uh, you know, there's, there's more um, awareness raising about it. Uh, let me say something about the, the conventions that I've spoken about. Uh, it's the Addis Convention, which is at the African level and the Global Convention. Now, the Ellis the, the Convention has gone through the, the various processes and so on. Um, and I must say that in some cases, um, uh, that the kind of alignment needs to happen. Uh, for example, uh, Judy, uh, the Ellis Convention is, uh, in contra uh, contradicts quite a number of the, the draft policy on internationalization, for example. You know, so, on the one hand, sometimes peop, you know, people formulate policy, but that policy is against what is already law. Um, so, you know, so, so, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is that there are, there are those kinds of stuff. One of the reasons why I support the Addis Convention because um, we've been struggling for a long time in the country to get recognition of prior learning so that people can take it seriously at various institutions and so on. Now it is, be part of what was ratified by Parliament. And so institutions will have to look at that and say, are we against you know, what, is, uh, what is law? And we also have a situation in South Africa now that people are becoming more and more aware of their rights and so on because we are a constitutional democracy. And I foresee that more and more people are going to go to the courts to force institutions uh, you know, to comply with the law. Because there are many institutions that doesn't comply with the law, you know. So I'm saying that you know, um, it seems to me that uh, uh, you know, uh, 
we need to get uh, perhaps uh, civil society or NGOs and so on that focuses on these kinds of things. In fact, let me not say it's not that we don't have it. Uh, Section 29, for example, the 29 or 27, 27, is one of those examples of uh, you know where they really look at things and so on and taking up you know the plight uh, of people. So that's the one. The second, uh, Andre, uh, what is wrong? Um, what to do. But look, I think national qualifications frameworks on the one hand has got all of these things in. So for me, a national qualifications framework is uh, what some people said it is um, what you would like to see coming out. You know, So it is stuff that we, this is what we would like to see. But as I said, the problem is alignment. What, what gets taught and all of those kinds of stuff doesn't necessarily uh, you know, translate. And so a big issue for me is about the alignment. On the other hand, uh, uh, you know, some people will say to you, I mean, you can take people through an ethics course. It doesn't mean that they're going to act in an ethical way. So there are other factors also that plays a role uh, with regard to that. Uh, so in my view, I'm not too sure whether there's something wrong in terms of what we have set out to do. There's nothing wrong to say that we would like critical thinkers and so on. The key question is how, how do we make sure that you know, that we, at the end of the day, we do have critical thinkers and so on. Uh, so what is it that we are putting into, uh, you know, the learning programs and so on? And do we make sure that, um, do we just give people a certificate at the end if they don't meet what it is that we set out to do? So, you know, for me, I think that is where there's a problem of Muslim language. Thank you, Joe. Final round. Uh, Hi, Joe. Um, my name's Baz. I'm focused on uh, digital transformation. And um, I think, firstly, congratulations for what you've done and, and for this evening. My question is around leadership. I've, you've mentioned quite a few concepts this evening which, which touch on it. So you've mentioned democratic participation. You've mentioned, um, you know, climate policy and, and fourth industrial revolution. You've mentioned leadership elements in that. My question goes to what does the, the qualifications framework look at in terms of leadership? Are we driving for a different type of leadership, a more participatory, inclusive, distributed leadership, distributed power? Because the models that I see are asymmetric, hierarchical, autocratic, capital gain at all costs. And in those kind of scenarios, it's very hard to think about climate. It's very hard to think about technology change with heart. Um, then it's you being led by the big corporates internationally because we can't think differently. So should we not be looking there? Because if we're talking at the middle level that we should be as working as teams and participating, but the head of the organization, be it an institution or a corporate organization is driving an asymmetric model, do we not need to change the way that we're educating? And you spoke about ethics. G b being on an ethics course doesn't make you an ethical person. But if we focus on ethics and everybody's educated in that way, it does move us in that direction. And should we not be looking at the leadership elements of our frameworks? Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe, for being here also. I, I want to ask you, on hindsight, now that you have left, would you agree that the national qualifications framework, in most instances, are misunderstood, are not known, uh, it does not share the equal weight in the entire education spectrum and what is it is supposed to be hidden away there to the extent where it was a big fight uh, to get um, uh, money always to, to go to this segment uh, of, of uh, the entire education uh, stream. 
it's been understood when somebody decides to find out they want to employ somebody and they will then want to find out does the person necessarily have the correct uh, qualifications. As the only time that it really will hit some, some um, uh, airways uh, and so on. On hindsight, if you agree with me, why do you think it is the case and what is it maybe moving forward uh, that can be done in this instance? Equally so on the, um, uh, Julie said, I must ask you how many people were arrested after we passed the um, Sakwa uh, Act? <laughs> after we said that it is illegal in the country to misrepresent your qualification and all the other beautiful words that we um, have have used. Chair, if you don't mind, I'll take the opportunity to thank him for working with him. Um, it, uh, it was a great uh, journey. It was an interesting journey that uh, had its challenges and so on. There were many times we had to calm him down <laughs> <laughs> and ask him just to listen to us uh, also. We will reach his goals, what he wanted to. My name is Connie September, and Joe introduced me earlier on already. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Mulfred, and I'm from the Adult Learning Forum. I've got one foot in the formal and one in the non-formal education. Um, Joe, thank you very much for that insight that you gave us. I've got a very simple question, but it's a very complex uh, issue. Um, when the National Qualifications Framework came out, we had to educate the business world about what this is all about. And I think they still don't get it. Um, we how do we bring business on board? Because at the moment, you spoke about people's profile and competencies and the experience, but the business world is looking for the paper qualifications. There's loads and loads of people out there with um, quality experience, but they don't have the papers. And I think with our RPL system, we've failed miserably. We haven't actually taken that issue very seriously. I mean, just um, look at the bush mechanics. The electricians have no papers. They've got to get somebody to sign it off, but they wire a whole house. And we say, we have a shortage of skills. So how do we think, bring business together with us, accepting people's profiles and the experience and stop looking for, you know, yes, qualifications is important. But we do get people with loads of qualifications, which actually doesn't, I don't want to say it. <laughs> yes. So how do we bring business on board with people's competencies? Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, for being here. Um, my name is Jeff Locke. Jeff. I work for an organization called the International Labor Research and Information Group Trust, which is an NGO. And I basically want to answer the previous question is that if you, you can bring business to the water, but you can't make business drink. <laughs> so... I just actually want to reinforce Joe's point that the NQF is the base rock of our democracy because the NQF Act was one of the first, if not the first act to be passed in this country in 1994. So please, I would just exhort everyone here to popularize the NQF to whichever um, biased constituency you do come from because it is the bedrock of a cornerstone of one of our <laughs> <laughs> parts about democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Google, you said I must be, uh, I must be brief. Well, Joe, so, you're there. Why are you sharing your wonderful Okay. 
You know, one of the uh, revolutionary people and so on uh, said, you know, when you know, you must always shout out loud what is happening to you. So, so that's what I'm trying to do. Look, I, I, I agree with the issue about the leadership models. I think we actually need to look elsewhere. Um, let me also get back to the point about, um, you know, what is the NQF? In fact, um, as a mechanism, you know, if you look at what is really useful knowledge, you must look at those qualifications that are registered, that comes through. Those are experts that sit and they say, this is what we want to see in this thing. Um, so, so really, if you want to get a sense of what, is, what people really and what our establishment really think what is useful, then you must look and analyze that. So, so I totally agree with you. And again, I'm going to say, um, if, if you are absent, if you are not engaging, in fact, the stuff that is going to go through is not the stuff that you're talking about. Um, um, yes, I agree. I think that the NCRF is misunderstood, not known, and so on. Um, uh, uh, Connie, what do you expect when you set up an organization and you underfund it and people come to you? I mean, you know how many times I've come to the portfolio committee. In fact, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Connie was saying there to calm it down, I threw my toys out of the cot at a meeting when she wasn't there. Uh, I think she was in Zambia or some other place like that. Huh? Yes. Well, <laughs> but they basically were saying to me when I was saying, we actually need proper funding. They said to me, no, you know, we'll speak to the department. I said, we spoke to the department last year, the previous year, the previous year. Nothing happens. And they said, you've got the wrong attitude. So, so yes. <laughs> um, then the question about how many people are arrested, let me first of all say, you know, one of the th reasons why I fought with the portfolio committee is that they didn't even know that the NCF Amendment Act was passed. Now, I mean, how do you get a portfolio committee that doesn't know that the previous, um, that the uh, act has gone through parliament? I mean, I think it is outrageous, actually. You know, so the preparation that, I mean, this portfolio committee that we've got there, really, I mean, so, 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 so I'm saying I'm sad with regard to that. They don't know that. But the other thing also um, is um, we cannot arrest anybody because when the act was um, signed by the president, he also said he must promulgate it. So it is not in force. What you have put through parliament is not in force. Yes. <laughs> um, adult education. Um, Yes, I, I, I mean, I agree, you know, that uh, uh, there's lots of things that one could do better and so on um, in terms of uh, RPL. Um, let me also say I'm also not uh, so pessimistic because when we started out, RPL wasn't really an issue and so on. Today we've got, uh, I mean, universities across the length and breadth of this country has got policies in terms of RPL. They're not implementing the full policy. But the point is that they're allowing it for access. And I think you know we actually need to also be positive and say there's been some movement. It is slow, and it is frustrating. But there's at least some movement. And we actually need to push them more so that we can move on. Thank you very much. Uh, there will be more time to engage with uh, Professor Samo, <laughs> RPLing him. Um, but one of the things that he has done very well <laughs> in his life was to marry the most amazing, uh, smart, young, cheeky, crazy mm. woman called Marie Louise, who is going to come up now and pay tribute to her husband. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Wow, that's a surprise, eh? Surprise pack. <laughs> I think Joe is probably more surprised than what I am um, <laughs> because he knows that it's, sometimes it's very difficult for me to say some of the things that I would like to say. But I think when, uh, when, when, <laughs> when Noel asked me to do this, I said, Noel, are you serious? You know, I mean, how do you pay tribute to your husband? Um, 
But I think that I'm very <laughs> proud, Joe, um, to be able to do it uh, now. And as Google said uh, right, right at the beginning, that I don't have to stand up after he's dead and say something about him. I can actually say it about him now while he's still alive. But some of you that know him know that he's, uh, now that he's kind of moved into uh, uh, st uh, early retirement in um, quotation marks, um, he claims that he's an amateur photographer. <laughs> um, when I look at the, at the photographs that he takes, there's absolutely no way that any of my photographs come close to what he does. So in my view, I think he's, he's, he's not really such an amateur at the job. But I looked at Joe, um, what are the characteristics of a good photographer? And a lot of what was being said there um, really spoke to me as a wife, as a friend of his, um, and I think it will, you know, for some of you as well, the colleagues and previous bosses, Shirley, um, <laughs> that you might recognize Joe in some of these things. But the first one really is about creativity and imagination. And although Joe always says he's very boring, he, if, whenever he does a presentation and I say, how did it go? He says, it was boring. Okay, if you think it's boring, then what do the people that you were with think? <laughs> but one of the things that is always very uh, stimulating for me is his ability to think outside of the box. Um, and so he does not see anything as an impossibility, but rather what can we do about it? And sometimes I'm very negative about things, and I would say, you know, complain and complain, and he would say, stop complaining. What is it that we can do? And so I think that um, that is certainly something that, um, that stays with me. Now, Google, when we were, when we were you know, early in our marriage, um, we had these children, you know, like one on top of each other. Um, <laughs> and I just couldn't cope with these children. <laughs> I mean, I just gave birth to them. And Joe dealt with the rest. <laughs> so... Um, Sometimes people say to me, how did you cope with all of these things? Look, I'm, I also want to say I'm a strong woman, so I'm not going to say he did it. Um, but really, he cleaned those shitty nappies. He wiped that vomit off the floors and stuff because I couldn't do it. Um, but he also was very creative. You know, he would sit in the bedroom there and he would come up with songs. And so we all know the song, where is the light, where is the teddy bear, where is the clock, and where is Rabbi Rabbit, oh, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> now, we, we're still singing that, and um, his grandchild um, even knows that. And so we've got to point at the, instru you know, at the things, where is the light. So you know what was in our bedroom, um, because those were the things that were in the bedroom. But he earlier spoke about this robot that he has, but he didn't humanize the robot. Because we know Ayanda. Ayanda is this robot that came into our house last year. And we had to listen to the story of Ayanda every night. <laughs> because Ayanda was able, you see, do you know that you can work? Sorry for those that are Kasatu types. <laughs> um, <laughs> But Joe said, do you know that Ayanda can work 24-7? <laughs> she doesn't need maternity leave. She, <laughs> you know, she just keeps working. And when you come to work on a Monday, those uh, qualifications have already been checked out. So um, the, the, I think that Ayanda became part of our daily conversation. But the question was always asked. The children would always say to him, so, Daddy, what's happening with the people that were doing the work? And he always indicated that those people will still have jobs. They just have to look at other things that they have to do. The second thing that a, a good photographer does is he has a, an eye for detail. Now, besides the fact that um, any of you that have had any dealings with him will know that he carries that NQF Act, the little book, in his pocket... So as soon as you say something that sounds like it is not according to something <laughs> in that book, 
he whips it out and kind of quotes it at you <laughs> and um, he takes it out of context and you've got to fight with him and say, that's not what I'm saying, but the book <laughs> is there. Now, in our, in our lives as a family, um, he taught the children that they needed to present their argument to him um, in a coherent way. So it, when they were planning a party, a 10-year-old party, they had to present him with a proposal <laughs> with budget included. And then we would discuss the pros and cons of the party. And the part that really was what the children never got was, what do you do when the person comes in at the gate? What do you do with them until you make the speech? <laughs> and he wanted to know everything about all of that. Now, they hated it. Um, they did it because they wanted to have a party. But today I laugh when I listen to the children talking about their organizations and telling me that there's no planning. People are not doing this, you know. <laughs> so some of the things that he did, uh, you know, uh, has rubbed off on them. And I'm sure Gugu won't mind if I tell you a story about our first housewarming party in, Cape, in, in Pretoria, which was organized by Noel. Um, now, she knew Joe and she knew me, but she didn't know we were married. And so we landed up in the kitchen and she said to me, what? Look at this. He has a program for the children on the fridge and he's marked it off when they did what? Who does that? And I said, my husband. <laughs> Gugu, Gugu almost died. <laughs> but that night... We could tell you many, many stories about that night. Um, I'm only going to say that the police came to the house many times <laughs> to try to stop the party. And that was our welcome to Pretoria. <laughs> the third one, Joe, is patience and flexibility. I must say that you have more patience in taking your photos that you than you have with us. But... If I look at how long it takes you to take a photo and how many photos you take of the same scene and you can tell me about what is different in these hundreds of photos, it's amazing. But what is very nice to see is how he takes those photos. So you have to pull off the road immediately when he says, just stop. You know, you must just stop. It doesn't matter whether there's a place for you to put the car or anything. But as Google says, you know, people were very worried about the fact that, I, that Joe married me because they always said, I like loud parties, I drink alcohol. He doesn't do those things. So he's good at two, whatever, you know. And, and I'm the bad one because <laughs> everybody thinks that he does all these good things. But it is linked to the fact that he does have some good people skills. And I think that over the 30-odd the years, 33 years that we have been together, there are some things that stand out for me about you, Joe. On Christmas Day, for example, you insisted that we've got to take plates of Christmas dinner to the security at Sakwa. I don't know who's going to take those Christmas plates dinners <laughs> to them in the future. You also, when we're in an environment, you find people that are not comfortable with the surroundings and you're able to make them comfortable. I've never heard Joe introduce himself as a CEO of Sakwa. Connie, he travels economy class as the CEO of Sakwa and he always has. And he doesn't do it only because he, um, he, he wants to be somebody special. It is because it is the right thing to do. You don't need to have somebody tell you to do something when you know that it's the right thing to do. And so that is not something that was part of what um, he did. I think the last thing, Gugu, now that you're staring at me, <laughs> is that <laughs> no one can deny the fact that Joe has passion for what it is that he does. And thank goodness, as a family, we only had to deal with a few passions. So Joe worked at, at, at the university. Um, and uh, believe it or not, my encounter with him was about the mobility of sperm. So I looked at how fast 
sperm was going on a screen, Google. <laughs> Nowhere else, only on the screen, yeah. <laughs> the second job that he had was at case. And then we were exposed to adult education and he threw all these people at us. And we, l we met all these people that are sitting in the back row there. Um, and they know what I thought about Case, because <laughs> Case took Joe away from us. Um, and then he moved to Sakwa. So it's been very simple. It was UWC, it was Case, and then it was Sakwa. And now we're all into this NQF, um, and we don't always get the language right, Joe, but we try our best. So <laughs> when Joe puts his life into these organizations, he put all of us as a family into it as well. But I am proud to say that I was part of all of those stages, and I look forward, Joe, to spending my our last days together. Joe keeps reminding me that retirement is about the race to the end of your money or your end of your life. <laughs> so I don't know which one is going to come first. <laughs> But for us, it will be, we will be spending our, our last days together, and hopefully we will continue to make a difference in the world. I want to end, as Joe started his presentation, by saying that what happened um, in our family for the, you know, for the past, since that uh, episode, um, just makes me say that I want to end with something that he has said in a post on the 11th of February, 2020. And this post said, and he was talking about the fact that on the 11th of February, as a family, we had gone and we had um, demonstrated our commitment to the change that was happening in the country. And... Um, and he said on this year that um, this is what we committed to do during the struggle. No one will bully us or victimize us and think we will keep quiet. Fighting against injustice is, in the words of President Mandela, an ideal that I'm prepared to die for. Joe, we're in this together. So wherever we go with whatever is going to happen in the future, as a family, we are with you. Thank you. Nice surprise. Um, I was hoping there were other secrets that were going to come out, but thank you very much, Mary. Um, what she didn't tell you is that when the police came uh, that day, uh, Noel, after many, 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 many classes, <laughs> went to them and said, there are so so there's probably rape happening out there, and butler is happening, and you want to bother us at the party. It was very irritated. Um, <laughs> and it was true, because we were just having fun, uh, and they were wasting all of their resources on us. Um, and um, unfortunately, hi, John. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave. I'm, I'm going to Durban, and my last flight is in a few minutes. Um, but I want to end by thanking Noel for the amazing, amazing idea of having this tribute. I think that it's the best, <laughs> it's the best gift that you can, you, that you could have given to this amazing man. And we are privileged to have been part of your journey, Joe. And thank you for allowing us to share our stories with not just him, but with the family as well. And thank you for making the time on a Thursday to come and tell Joe how special he has been in our lives. And Joe, we look forward to many more engagements. Mari doesn't want to have you there all the time, so <laughs> please find something to do. <laughs> Photographs. In fact, when you Google Joe, the photography thing comes up first. So, but <laughs> thank you so much for, for, for your gift. Thank you very I wish you well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to Gugu um, for um, being the MC for this part. And I'm very pleased to hand over to Shakira now, Shakira Drama. It's almost a symbolic handing over of the baton because, uh, of course, Shakira represents the next generation. 
And at Cornerstone, Shakira will be <laughs> Shakira, <laughs> Shakira will be hosting our critical dialogues um, for the rest of the year. And this is the first one that we've actually done in this way um, for this year. But there are critical dialogues coming up in April, May, June, July for the rest of the year. And uh, Shakira is the person who's going to be organizing those for us. So it's very apt that Shakira comes up now and be our, our MC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. And to Gugu, it was a complete pleasure meeting you today. And thank you so much for being here. Um, yeah, I'll just give her a minute to say a goodbyes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next guest, who will also be doing a tribute to Joe, Professor Amarita Shirley Walters. Um, and Shirley is the founding director of the Division for Lifelong Learning. Uh, she was previously the founding director at the, sorry, at the Center for Adult and Continuing Education at UWC and has been a professor of adult and continuing education since 1986. She has published widely on issues relating to gender, popular education, community education, lifelong learning in higher education, learning regions, and education for democracy. Before joining UWC, Shirley worked as a high school teacher, a training officer on a diamond mind, and as well as being the director <laughs> of a community organization. She's been involved with many civil society organizations which are concerned <coughs> with issues of social justice um, and the promotion of lifelong learning. She was the founder of the Women's Hope uh, Education and Training Trust, which supports women leadership development. Um, and for four years, Shirley was the chairperson of the Learning Cape Festival, uh, a provincial initiative to promote the province as a learning region. In her spare time, Shirley enjoys the outdoors and is a, rec a recreational cyclist. Um, and she's traveled while, uh, widely and <laughs> wildly, maybe. <laughs> widely and maybe. wildly. <laughs> um, and she's worked for short periods in many countries, including South and North America, Asia, Europe, and of course, Africa. So if you can please give a warm round of applause to Professor Amarita Shirley Walters. I don't know where they find these curricula vitae. <laughs> Thank you very much, and good evening, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'll, I won't keep you too long. I know it's becoming a long evening. Um, but it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation um, to, in fact, uh, pay tribute to Joe. Um, and I think there, there are quite a lot of resonances between what people have already said and what I will say. Um, but maybe put a little bit of a twist to it. So I want to just start when it all started, which is once upon a time. Um, in 1985, to be precise, a white-coated young man popped his head around the corner of my caravan on the UWC campus. I had just been appointed a founding director of Adult and Continuing Education. Um, they had forgotten to allocate me an office so I found a caravan like Quickjack and started to work. Very soon, there was activity with students and staff coming and going to collect posters and pamphlets for the next protest. It was 1985, after all. Repression was strong and resistance was vigorous. The polite physiology lecturer, sperm researcher, whom you heard from Mari, <laughs> and Catholic student activist introduced himself. Uh, I'm Joe Samuels, and I'm wondering what you, what's going on here. He's always been quite a curious guy. <laughs> Two hours later, after intense uh, conversations about radical adult education, activism, Paolo Freire, Joe left. Um, and it's now 35 years later, and we're still talking to one another. <laughs> um, I've entitled my short presentation in tribute to Joe, a leadership that disturbs the future. So the question about leadership. Um, as the organizational change and leadership guru Michael Fullan states, a complex world needs visionary leaders who do disturb the future with moral purpose, who understand change, who stress the centrality of building relationships, who are committed to building knowledge, and who create coherence while realizing 
that consistent coherence is a, is a dangerous thing. I'll use these five categories to paint vignettes of my understanding of Joe as a leader. Um, I describe Joe as an activist bureaucrat. This may seem contradictory and may upset Joe. Sorry, Joe. After all, bureaucrats are those people who are understood as technicians who follow the rules and ensure that others do the same. Following the rules is essential as a way of ordering and governing society. However, not all the rules are necessarily fair and just. Therefore, they must be challenged. New policies and regulations developed in order to align with the socially just dispensation. An activist orientation is essential to bringing about change. Joe embodies both sensibilities of bureaucrat and activist. This is a very unusual combination. And in, a, in addition, I think um, what we've seen demonstrated tonight is that Joe is also a scholar activist. Joe's moral purpose relates, as we've heard several times tonight, to social justice, particularly for people who have been oppressed and discriminated against or excluded through political, cultural, or economic policies and practices. And the South African NQF was very much a project about social justice including articulation and access for those historically kept out of the system. It has been the major lever within the South African society for promoting lifelong learning, uh, for the very young to the ancient, like some of us here. The NQF has contributed to a new vision for education and training for the country. It was therefore unsurprising that Joe left us um, at the Center for Adult and Continuing Education after seven years to work with Samuel Isaacs, the first CEO of SACWA. The NQF originated with a strong moral purpose. It needed visionary thinking, careful and meticulous construction across the full range of education and training stakeholders and sectors. Joe, as we've heard, has spent 21 years at SACWA with the last eight as CEO. And the question of justice has been his lodestar. Joe is generally, I'm not sure that Mari agrees, but uh, Joe is generally, I thought, quite a tolerant person. Uh, but injustice, he cannot tolerate. Understanding change. In all my years of work in universities and civil society, I've been amazed at how few people seem to understand organizational change. I remember one day Joe and I were discussing architectural changes to the case building. We had a three-dimensional model of the building and we were literally moving walls and doors in order to understand how physical changes would influence movement of people and relationships in the use of the building. It was a moment in the simple practice of deepening our understandings of how material conditions affect behavior profoundly both in architectural design and in society in general. Joe understands change strategies. He knows about the politics and the administration around policy development and policy implementation. He recognizes that it's all in the detail. He is prepared to spend hours, I think as we've already heard, into the night and day to ensure that the details are in place, that the political relationships are built. He also recognizes that building capacity for change is essential. He is, commit, he is a committed adult educator who has, as we saw with the children's parties, um, <laughs> who has emphasized leadership development within SACWA and elsewhere through staff development programs amongst others. He knows that change takes a long time, that it requires doggedness that incorporates, and here I think I agree, uh, Mari will agree, it incorporates both passion and patience. Relationships. Building organizations, working for change, is about relationship building. I wonder if Joe or Mari or the children have ever attempted to quantify how many hours Joe has spent in meetings, planning for meetings, following up after meetings. The political, social, and community building work is something that Joe does naturally. He has, a very, he has a way of gently challenging, cajoling, befriending, sometimes not so friendly, 
While at Case, Joe invested much time and energy into the building of the Adult Education and Training Association of South Africa to help organize the field of adult education. At SACWA, he has been the driving force to build relationships, as we've heard in, in Joe's talk, both in the SADC region, in Africa, and more broadly, to encourage cooperation and coordination of effort. Building knowledge. Under both Samuel Isaacs and Joe's leadership, the NQF has been recognized as a knowledge project. It challenges hundreds of years of theorizing about the relationship amongst education and work. And I think when people ask the question, why is the NQF not fully appreciated? It's because it's doing an a large theoretical piece of work. It's, you know, we've understood education, training, and work in particular ways over hundreds of years. And that's what we're trying to challenge. It challenges whose knowledge counts, for example, with the recognition of prior learning. The NQF is both an administrative structure, structure and a place for theory building and action research, which engages and encourages scholarship. There are several examples, but one I will highlight is the cooperative training course that SACWA and UWC um, ran entitled Leaders for Lifelong Learning. It was a mixed mode course which drew several people from the SADC region, including South Africa, to interrogate, study, and theorize NQFs and lifelong learning. SACWA leadership approached this as centrally about staff development, which encouraged all levels of SACWA staff to be critical thinkers about their work. The joint research projects with various universities are other essential examples of the building of knowledge which is relevant both to South Africa and globally. Coherence making. As a leader disturbing the future within a complex national uh, innovative education and training project, leaders need to continually ask, what are we trying to do? Which was the question Joe asked earlier. What's the NQF for? Why are we doing it? Who will benefit? How do the different pieces of the puzzle fit together? Joe, is, Joe has worked as encouraging everyone to engage with the problems. Not to be pressurized to have all the answers, but to continually be curious. But this is very difficult. Within an increasingly bureaucratized, tight financial regime, where achieving clean audits is a key measure of success and SACWA has achieved this every year, where auditors and lawyers rule. It can be hard to hold the tension for staff to be encouraged to be intellectually curious and at the same time be administratively and technically on top of their game. Within the contemporary world, learning has never been more important for all life forms as we navigate the, the climate crises we have to be learning, unlearning, and relearning. In Amitav Ghosh's recent book, Gun Island, he says, and I quote, it must be hardest on Rainy, the dolphin, knowing that the young ones depend on her. There she is, perfectly adapted to her environment. Then things begin to change, so that all those years of learning become useless. The places you know best can't sustain you anymore, and you've got to find new hunting grounds. Rainy must have felt that everything she knew, everything she was familiar with, the water, the currents, the earth itself, was rising up against her. Close quote. As with Rainy, all life is having to adapt in order to survive rapidly changing climate. We have to unlearn in order to develop new attitudes, understandings, and capabilities for new conditions. Learning is the work. We need many leaders who disturb the future. Joe is one of them, who has integrated the five components with energy, enthusiasm, and hopefulness. Joe, we recognize and appreciate the major contributions you have made. And we know that you will continue to give leadership that disturbs the future, which is consistent with your moral and ethical purposes. Amber Gagutle. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Shirley. Okay, and with that, uh, we are nearing the end of our program. I know it's getting quite late. Um, Noel has asked me to speak a little bit about this year's program and the next event, which will be happening in April. But before I do that, I'd like to take a step back, if that's okay, um, and just speak about how I ended up here. So towards the end of last year, I attended the Cornerstone Reclaiming Agency program, which takes place over three days in November. Um, and it was really amazing for me to get an invite to attend this program. I got it from someone who was on one of the panels, and it was absolutely incredible. I spent that Thursday, Friday, and Saturday attending almost every one of them, and I was just so amazed by the incredible topics that were being covered. Um, and some of the highlights that I remember was uh, going to a talk on community development and also one about the geopolitics of the inner city, uh, which speaks to my activism and anti-gentrification side. And then I also attended one on arts management, which happened in this exact auditorium, which speaks to my business and artistic side. Um, and it was just so refreshing to be in a space where these conversations were welcomed and encouraged, actually. Um, and subsequent to that, Noel and I had a few meetings, and this year I started with a critical dialogue program, which I'm extremely honored to be working on. Um, and I'm extremely honored to be here with all of you amazing people in the room, um, with Joe, Shirley, Gugu, Marie-Louise, Noel, and everyone else who I've met over this time. Um, as a young person who's kind of just coming into the world, these are the types of spaces that you really want to be in. And these are the types of people that you really want to be around. So I'm humbled and thank you. Um, and so with that, I'd like to give you some teasers into what you can expect this year. Um, the next event will be taking place on the 7th of April and we'll be hosting it here. Um, it's going to be an intergenerational discussion on youth unemployment and what tertiary institutions can do to help the unemployment rate and to prepare youth um, for when they're going into a world where 40.1% of 15 to 35 year olds are unemployed. So that's going to be quite an interesting one. We have some amazing panelists for that. Um, and then I'm not going to tell you the entire program. It will be up on Cornerstone's website, but just to give you, to sort of get you excited. Some of the things that we'll be covering in September, we'll be doing a celebration of indigenous languages through storytelling and poetry, so I'm quite excited for that one. Um, we'll be looking at whether or not social media is killing freedom of speech. Um, we'll be looking at the role of formal education in an era of self-directed learning. And so, I think I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we have a lot of exciting things happening this year, and so I hope that we will definitely see you on the 7th of April. Um, it will start the same time as this one, so we'll be starting at 5.30, and it will end round about the same time. Um, light refreshments and drinks will be served as well, and I think it will be quite a, a vigorous discussion, so I'm very excited for that. Um, and so, I think that Rudy has left No, Oh, no, Rudy's over here. So if I can please call Rudy up just to say a few words. After that, Sunday Seaway will come and do some thank yous, and then we'll have some mingling, and you can enjoy some more wine and food. And all of those who didn't get to ask Joe those pressing questions, he <laughs> will be around to answer them for you. Rudy? So good evening, everyone. I'm Rudy. Um, I'm Dean here at Cornerstone. Um, so Joe and Shelley and everyone else, uh, something clicked for me tonight, and that is regarding RPL. Um, with uh, Alan, um, Alan Ralph, right? We're working on sort of the RPL thing at UDAPS, from UDAPS as well and so. And But reali I realized there's an actual fact the exercise uh, with uh, recognition of prior learning is to actually try and describe the knowledge um, world that people create through, throughout their lives, to describe that and then assess how it goes into other things. So that kind of work is really important for us at Cornerstone. So um, um, I wanted to sort of raise that to say, you know, the work that you've been doing over so many years is really alive and well. <laughs> and the heart of it is a real debate. Tomorrow morning we have another sort of our second debate um, around how that works. We're talking about should students actually be prepared with three or four or five or six months before they get to selection, you know. <laughs> so, um, but thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and it's an honor to actually shake your hand.
and in a sense, uh, for me at least, sit at your feet. So, um, um, and I mean it because, um, you know, you in, in running an institution, you struggle with this, this kind of stuff almost, and it becomes quite technical. And what it has done at Cornerstone is actually to unleash, and that's the correct word, unleash debate. Um, so uh, at this point, we have a debate around when you, when you enter level seven. Is it level seven proper? Or do you get to level seven at the third year, for argument's sake? It's a simple thing, but it at least is a major discussion on what you expect of students and so mm. forth. Anyways, it's exciting stuff. And if you haven't engaged on the NQF yet properly, then you, you've not lived. You've not really lived. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you for being here tonight. And I'll thank you for your leadership. And thank you for, you know, hearing the stories that you've been doing this for many years. We respect that. So if these are your colleagues, we are privileged to be your, yours as well. So I uh, respect you as I respect to you. Thank you for being here. So the actual thank you would be from Sandiswe. I wanted to give you a sense that uh, Sandy Siwe is, is it, um, that uh, the debate here tonight is a continuing one. So thank you. Good evening. Uh, Good just evening. a quick thank you to everyone. I'm going to start with the guest of honor. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your lecture and thank you for your contribution. Um, then I would love to thank Gugu, who's not here at the moment, but thank you very much for coming as well. Thank you to Shirley. Um, thank you to Mari Louis. That was a great tribute. <laughs> um, thank you to Bulelan Ndindwa uh, with NB Supplies, who supplied us with the wine this evening, uh, which you can enjoy after this. Mingle, enjoy yourselves. Then thank you to Bush Radio, one of our partners, where this will then be live broadcast in the coming month. That will be announced on our Facebook page. Thank you to the Cape Argus, also one of our partners. They published an op-ed today written by the guest of honor. If you saw that, uh, please pick up a paper if you didn't. Otherwise, we'll also post it on our social media pages, so keep, up, keep a lookout for that one. Then thank you to the Cornerstone community, which you now form a part of since you are here, and we look forward to seeing you at the next Critical Dialogues. Uh, thank you, drive safely, and please enjoy the rest of the meals and drinks.